welcome to epg parashala i am dr vijay kumar i am now heading the department of library and information science of university of kerala thiruvananthapuram i am also the honorary director of center for information literacy studies of university of kerala and here i am dealing with a module of the course um, knowledge society and the module that i will be dealing with is uh, e-commerce and e-governance and here first of all let us see uh, uh, the in a nutshell what i am going to deal with so the major objective of this module is to deal with one examine what is meant by e-commerce and e-governance then to describe the major players in e-commerce then to attempt a classification of e-commerce and to examine the prerequisites for e-governance then identify the skills needed for the successful functioning of the e-governance then the what infrastructural facilities are needed for uh, e-governance then uh, to make a review of uh, the uh, benefits of uh, e-governance and to make an overview of the e-governance initiatives and finally to make uh, to examine the recommendations made by the national knowledge commission towards the implementation of the e-governance in our country so this is in a nutshell perhaps all of you are aware of the fact that e-commerce and e-governance are two integral part of the knowledge society so now let us start what is meant by or let us examine what is meant by e-commerce e-commerce as perhaps most of you may know is where business transactions take place via the telecommunication networks especially the internet and as all of you know the information and communication technology has brought in or has revolutionized the entire information scenario and in its wake came the e-commerce also so e-commerce in a nutshell is about doing business electronically since transactions are carried out through the internet and the web the terms e-commerce which stands for internet commerce and web commerce etc are also used but these terms are not used very frequently now they are seldom used and other terms that are used for online retail selling include e-tailing virtual stores and or uh, cyber stores now let us see um, who are the major players in e-commerce the major players in e-commerce are first vendors then commerce service providers then e-merchants and end users now let us see uh, what is meant by vendors vendors are actually the manufacturers and vendors of e-commerce systems and components it is it is interesting to note that these vendors can also be e-service providers and then the commerce service providers are the major players who provide planning building and running e-commerce solutions e-commerce solutions to merchants so they provide actually the solutions or rather the technological or ict solutions for uh, e-commerce and the third one e-merchants they are actually the uh, companies or the distributors who want to sell products sell products it is their products which are uh, purchased by uh, the end users and there are agencies also which facilitate this uh, the the marketing process they also belong to the category of e merchants and finally come the end users the end users are people like us okay who are uh, who take advantage of this facility perhaps you might have heard about big names like ebay or uh, uh, say for example walmart or uh, things like that okay uh, and most of you may be familiar with uh, amazon.com and these are the major players are commerce service providers as well as e merchants there are a number of factors which can be called as drivers of e-commerce and the major drivers of e-commerce are 
are the factors are one technological factors then political factors social factors and economic factors let us see what they stand for for example technological factors include the technological infrastructure like the backbone infrastructure and architecture internet service providers um, range of services available then the ownership that is whether it is owned by the private sector or the uh, public sector then the industrial players then the pricing policies then access to technology developments speed of implementation of the new technology by the industrial sectors now the political factors perhaps we are all aware that uh, they are actually the initiatives of the government the after, after all everything depends upon the political bosses and therefore if they are willing the e-commerce can spread like wildfire otherwise you know if they uh, they are not so interested you know they can uh, put hurdles on that say for example the number and type of um, government initiatives then the legislation which which plays a major role that all of you know uh, if only conducive legislation is made then only e-commerce can succeed otherwise you know the success of governments can put hurdles on that that is why legislation plays a major role or uh, uh, totally dependent on the political factors and next comes the social factors here comes the skills of the workforce even if the governments are willing even if technological infrastructure is there unless the political uh, unless the people are equipped with that if they are not ready to accept it if they are not skillful enough to adopt this uh, it is likely to fail and that is why the skills of the workforce the number of users of the online services then the penetration role of the in, the penetration of the internet and the level of education that is the computer literacy and it literacy of the people then the culture of the technophilia technophilia are the people who are uh, very uh, uh, lovers of the technology who readily adopt new and new technologies as and when they come if people are ready to adopt it this can this can spread our e-commerce can succeed tremendously and finally comes the economic factors and here also economic factors play a major role because um, the growth of the economy or the purchasing power of the people because you, if you if so much uh, if the market is even if the market is flooded with materials you know unless the people don't have the money there is no scope for that therefore the purchasing power and then the cost of the technology that also is a big factor if it if only the technology is affordable that is the software and hardware required for the purpose are affordable at a uh, cheaper rate then only people will be able to make use of that and then comes the innovative innovative business models if only competitive business models are there then only people will be adopting it so these in a nutshell are the factors which are uh, serve as drivers of e-commerce then let us see their classification of uh, e-commerce you know there are four significant categories of e-commerce the significant categories i stray i i uh, stress significant categories can be divided into four they are business to business otherwise known as b2b and then consumer to business that is referred to as c2b then business to consumer then b2c and consumer to consumer that is c to c and along with that you know that doesn't mean that these are the uh, uh, these there are only four types of commerce and depending upon the range of the relationships of all the transacting partners there can be more say for example as many as uh, 16 uh, uh, partners or 16 uh, uh, players can be identified and depending upon that the number of uh, uh, partnerships also increase say for example business to business b to b business to consumer b to z consumer to business c to b then consumer to consumer c to z then business to government that is business to b uh, b to b b to g then business to peer b to p consumer to government c to g consumer to peer c to p here peer means the end user and government to business g to b government to consumer g to z then government to government g to g then government to peer g to p then peer to business that is p to b peer to consumer 
P to Z, peer to government, P to G and finally peer to peer. People themselves can transact among themselves. So, so many varieties uh, are there uh, depending upon the partners who are the active partners of the e-commerce. Then as you might have understood by now that the governments have to play a major role in the spreading of e-commerce. They can foster, our governments can foster e-commerce by laws and regulations as we have already seen and say for example, digital signature laws. And if th that is implemented, that can go a long way in spreading the message of e-commerce and in facilitating e-commerce. Then, then there should be laws that protect the individual privacy that is there. Then enacting laws and regulations designed to regulate business and government behavior related to online transactions. Say if you want to uh, promote online transactions, there should be um, regulations, there should be laws that promote it. And then governments play a major role and they also play different roles in e-commerce. Sometimes they serve the purpose of facilitators, sometimes governments themselves play the role of consumers, sometimes they serve as suppliers of e-commerce related activities. The role of government changes from one occasion to another. Say for example, Governments evolve not only as e-commerce regulators, in short, governments serve not only as regulators, but they also uh, serve as players as well. And there are certain areas where governments play a direct role. And the major areas where governments can play a, a direct role are one, telecommunications. As you may are aware, in many of the countries, uh, uh, the telecommunication facility is owned by the governments and in our country that was the situation till a few years, uh, two years back and it, uh, uh, the portals of the telecommunication facility was thrown open to the uh, uh, private sector only in the last decade and till then that means everything, the success of the e-commerce depends upon the telecommunication facilities provided by the governments. Then. Online transactions for citizens and uh, business, the government should promote the online transactions. Then the government's procurement policy, say for example, very often governments procure things in a bulk, say for example, e-tendering facility, you might have heard about e-tendering, say for example, governments perhaps turn out to be the largest consumers of the products and therefore they buy things in bulk and e-commerce can play a major role in facilitating bulk, the bulk, bulk purchase. And then now nowadays governments are outsourcing many of the non-core governmental activities. Now what is meant by non-core governmental activities? Non-core governmental activities are activities which are not central to the activity of the government. Say for example, um, say revenue collection. This task is very often assigned to some of the agencies. Say uh, toll collection, the bridges are constructed by the governments, but the toll collection is entrusted with the uh, entrusted to the responsibility of some private parties. Okay, this is because collection of revenue, even though that adds to the cor corpus of the government income, it is not a direct activity. Say, for example, if you are fined for traffic violation, you can remit it in a bank. So that means the non-core activities are uh, passed down to some private parties and that is um, what is meant by the outsourcing. Now there are a number of impacts. You know e-commerce makes tremendous impact on society and the biggest impact is on marketing. Say for example, customization is possible. Say for example, there is direct, uh, uh, direct relation between the supplier as well as the, uh, the end user. The end user is in, in a position to dictate terms. They can directly ask for customization of the product. They can spell out their requirements that is and the supplier can customize the product according to the needs. That is very much uh, essential or that is very much uh, possible in e-commerce. Then advertisements has become all the more easy. Now you know 
the websites have become an integral part of uh, e-commerce and uh, advertisements through websites has become the order of the day. And then ordering system, as we have already seen, you can directly order with the supplier. And orderings, it has revolutionized the ordering system. Then it has thrown up markets. Markets, global markets have come up. If you want to purchase something, say for example, if you want to purchase a car, you can directly order, order it from the manufacturer either in Germany or in America or in Japan. And as a result, you know, new marketing models have also um, come up. And e-commerce have also brought in tremendous impact on organizations. It has, in fact, revolutionized the entire organizational culture. Technology and organizational learning. Say, for example, now most of the organizations have to fine-tune their ICT operations in order to equip themselves with the new answers of the e-commerce. Then, the ch changing nature of work is the next area. You have to work in a different environment. If you uh, keep on uh, doing things manually, you know, you may not be, uh, you may not emerge as a major player in e-commerce. Therefore, you have to change the nature of work and you have to have the, develop the capabilities of uh, developing new products. Say, as I said earlier, customization is the order of the day. You should be equipped, you should be ready to customize the products depending upon the uh, demands of the uh, users. Naturally, new product capabilities should also be developed. Then, the third area where e-commerce has uh, may, uh, played a crucial role is in the area of uh, manufacturing. And one of the biggest, uh, or one of the big revolution that has brought out by e-commerce is e-commerce is changing the manufacturing systems from mass production to demand driven production. To, that is just in time manufacturing. Say, just to cite an example in the case of books. Earlier, you know, books were printed in a lot, maybe of the order of thousands. The minimum quantity may be uh, th uh, thousand. Sometimes, if it is a major publisher, it may be five thousand or ten thousand. Then the problem comes, as all of you know, books cannot be sold out uh, immediately. Say, uh, in one year, some five hundred books will be sold out. Even then hundreds of books will be remaining, then you have to find a place for storing them. That is a major problem. Storing. Then that means you have to maintain a showroom. But now the scenario is entirely changed. Book producers or the publishers do not produce thousands of copies. Instead, they produce the, uh, depending upon the number of orders, perhaps they may come out with uh, 500 copies. Then as they receive new orders, they will produce just in time. That will be printed in, a, uh, printed in a day or two, that is got bound within a day and it is shipped within a day. That means on the third day or the fourth day, uh, that finds a destination. That is what is meant by just in time. That is a tremendous revolution uh, due, uh, that, that came up because of the uh, impact of e-commerce. And then you can give orders directly to the uh, production department. It need not go through uh, various channels. Say for example, primarily if you uh, place an order, it has to go through different channels and then only it will reach the production department. Now these uh, orders can be directly transferred to, thanks to the impact of information and communication technology, it can be directly passed down to the production department so that they can uh, straight away start the production and the delivery can be made as early as possible. That means the production time can be cut to at least 50%. And then, the next area where e-commerce plays a major role is in, on finance. E-commerce requires special finance and accounting systems. The age-old practice of double entry bookkeeping and uh, uh, the earlier manual practices will not hold good in such a changed scenario. Electronic cash has become essential. Digital signature to validate the payment has become um, necessary. And it is here in comes the role of the government. They have to make provision for, uh, uh, enact, they have to enact rules for making digital signature valid. Electronic cash has become essential in such a scenario. And now 
let us pass on to or let us examine what is meant by e-governance. Perhaps by this time you might have understood that e-commerce and e-governance are complementary to each other. Now let us see what is e-governance. E-governance is the use of a range of modern information and communication technologies like internet, local area networks, mobile phones, etc. by government or governmental agencies to improve the effectiveness, efficiency, service delivery and to promote democracy. And world over, you know, governments are switching over to e-governance facilities because of the merits offered by the e-governance. And in other words, e-governance is con connected with the public sector's use of information and communication technologies with the aim of improving the information and service delivery, encouraging participation of the citizens in the decision making process, then making governments more accountable, transparent and effective. These three terms are very important, accountability, transparency and effectiveness. These are the catchwords of e-governance that we will understand soon. Then in other words, the term e-governance refers to government's use of technology, particularly web-based internet applications to enhance the access to and delivery of government information and service to citizens, to all the stakeholders like business partners, employees, other agencies, government entities, uh, like government departments, etc. So the major objectives of e-governance are, one, to support and simplify governance, that is the prime objective. And the second one is to make government administration more transparent, speedy and accountable. And the third objective is to address the society's needs and expectations through efficient public services. And uh, finally, to facilitate effective interaction between people and government. And this area is more important, effective interaction between, speedier interaction between the government and the people, the citizens. That is the biggest advantage provided by e-governance. Now there are certain stages. E-governance cannot be implemented. It cannot develop in a vacuum. It has to pass through certain incremental stages. And in the final development, our uh, e-governance can be uh, made full, uh, fully usable only after passing through certain stages. And four stages have been identified. They are first, information, second, interaction, third, transaction, and fourth, transformation. All these four are the shun words. T-I-O-N, all these words end with the T-I-O-N, that is their suffix words are T-I-O-N, information, interaction, transaction and transformation. Say, information stage includes the publication of information through websites and the government expects the citizens to go through the websites to know about the things the policy decisions of the governments, the laws made by the governments, uh, all these are made available to the public uh, through the websites. That is the first stage of the e-governance. And if we examine the history of uh, the development of e-governance in our country, it also started like that. More, many of the organizations have started their websites and they began to make available the required information through the websites. That is the first stage. The second stage is the interaction stage. It involves interactivity. As the very name indicates, it involves interactivity. Here, clients can download applications for receiving services. Say, for example, even then it is unilateral. The, you can download. You will, get, you will not only get the information, you can also get the required application forms, required guidelines from the websites. That is the second stage. And in the third stage, this becomes more interactive. Here, the delivery of documents also takes place. Delivery of documents, not on one side. That means you can also download the information. You can also upload the information. Your request can also be placed uh, to the governments. 
say you can make an email uh, uh, email email request to somebody which will be responded to you will you will get the reply to your request say for example you can file an application say for example if you want to file uh, uh, a transfer request you can do it uh, through the website designated for that and that will be taken care of and you will get the results also say for example you want to get a building permit you can uh, 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 send it or you can upload it through the required website that will be processed and sanction maybe if you are eligible for that sanction will be given through uh, 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 sanction will be given online that is the third stage and the final stage that is the transformation stage that is the ultimate in the e-governance here it is not only really electronic delivery of from one agency but from all the related agencies even if more than one agency or even if a number of agencies are involved in the transaction process all these th agencies will get involved and this can be resulted uh, this will result in a uh, one stop window process that means even if many agencies are involved in the process all of them will get involved and you are likely to get or you will surely get the reply um, or uh, you are uh, get your redressal um, or your um, grievance redressed in no time and that is the ultimate stage in e governance and then as i said earlier e governance cannot flourish in a vacuum and there are certain prerequisites for that and the major prerequisites are one there should be a mature technical infrastructure as i said in the case of e commerce infrastructure a developed infrastructure is a, a must for the development of e-governance and that means various e-government uh, departments should equip themselves they should be not only really be equipped with ICT facilities they should also be ready with their files in the digital format then only the information can be passed on to the uh, needy as and when it is required and then next comes the role of the bureaucracy a bureaucracy which is willing to re-engineer re-engineer which is willing to change which is uh, uh, ready to reorient themselves and the bureaucracy which is ready to share information and treat the citizens as their customers as their valid customers and then as i said earlier deep penetration of internet that also is a must and then comes the social and political commitment on the part of the government as in the case of uh, e-commerce the commitment on the part of the government is also very much essential in the spreading of e-governance facilities then if the government is active you know definitely the legal framework will also be conducive only the governments can uh, modify they can make laws to propagate e-governance facilities and finally the citizens should be aware of their rights duties and responsibilities so even if all the facilities are there if there is nobody to make use of this facility you know there is no meaning in that that means the citizen should also be equipped they should also be made aware of their rights duties and responsibilities these are the major prerequisites required for uh, the propagation of e-governance facilities and again e-governance also called for um, um, some of the necessary skills that means successful e-governance demands several skills um, on the part of the people on the part of the team which is involved in e-governance they can be broadly categorized into four they are one project management skills then analytical and technical skills then information and knowledge management skills and finally communication and presentation skills that doesn't mean that these are the four skills needed but these are the major ones now let us examine them one by one say the project management skills that is managing a project perhaps you may know is the art of planning organizing staffing directing coordinating allocating resources negotiating negotiation is an integral part of that then uh, uh, tracking progress measuring the results and communicating the results to the stakeholders all these are involved in the project management skills then comes the second category that is analytical and technical skills this analytical skills 
imply the ability uh, of visualizing, articulating and solving problems and taking uh, appropriate decisions when needed. That is what is meant by analytical skills. Technical skills as, uh, as all of you know, your capacity to carry out those tasks. You should be technically qualified, you should be technically competent to carry out the tasks that has been, uh, uh, that has been decided upon. That is what is meant by technical skills. And then comes the fourth one that is information and knowledge management skills. And here comes knowledge management approach. Say for example, knowledge management uh, as uh, perhaps you may be uh, knowing that you should be familiar with the factual components. And you have to uh, develop certain techniques which are meant for the uh, say for example consolidating the factual information, the procedures involved, the uh, data modeling, all these components are there as far as uh, knowledge management skills are concerned. Then comes the communication and presentation skills and uh, anybody will agree that this is very vital unless you are not able to convince the stakeholders. Say for example, if you want to convince the authorities about the viability of a project, you have to present it effectively, efficiently. That depends upon, very much depends upon your method of approach and your ability to convince the authorities. Similarly, and if you want to convince the stakeholders, that means the end users of the need for adopting a particular uh, uh, technology, then also you have to present it effectively. So communication and the method of presentation play a vital role. Say for example, if the uh, parties involved are not convinced, you know, nothing is going to happen. If you want to uh, get the government to do something, definitely you have to convince not only the political bosses, but the bureaucrats too. All these stakeholders have to be convinced. So present communication and presentation skills also play a major role. And there are certain models. And these models are becoming very complicated. And say for example, uh, you can see five models are already available. The first one is a broadcasting model. Broadcasting model, as you know, is publicizing the things that need to be done. That is the very crude form as uh, that conforms to uh, the uh, first step in e-governance. That is propagating, making available the necessary information. Uh, that is making available through websites or making announcements through newspapers, etc. That is the first step. Then critical flow model. That is explaining the steps involved. What plan of action is there? That is critical flow model. Then comparative analysis model. Comparative analysis model is uh, said to be very much suited for developing countries like India because there you are making a comparison with the experiences elsewhere. What model has been adopted by others and you are drawing inspiration from that. You are learning lessons from that and you are uh, adopting a viable plan depending upon the earlier experiences of other countries. That is comparative analysis models. Then comes the e-advocacy or uh, mobilization and lobbying model. That means if you want to get something done, there are different approaches. You can lobby the opinion of people. Say for example, well placed individuals uh, 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 support you, definitely that will, be, uh, that will be done. Say for example, you can mobilize global opinion, international opinion on a vital issue. Say for example, if you uh, feel that a particular activity or a particular decision taken by a government is going to harm the nation as a whole or it is going to harm uh, a, a particular area. Then you can mobilize global opinion. Now we are living in a global village where uh, every issue uh, uh, you, can, you can raise it at the international level. If global support is there, you know, governments may go back. That means that is the policy of mobilizing or lobbying global opinion or international opinion to your advantage. That is e-advocacy model, then interactive service model. This is a model of making compromises. That means even if there is some difference of opinion, you try to solve it through interaction, through compromises. That is what is meant by interactive service model. So there are different e-governance models and uh, nobody can say that which model is ideal. That depends upon the situation um, and de that depends upon the uh, uh, item to be uh, dealt with. 
Now let us examine the benefits of e-governance. Say e-governance is spreading like wildfire or it is catching the attention of uh, many of the governments at the uh, international level and there should be definite advantages for that. The first one is that e-governance facilitates better delivery of government services to citizens. Better delivery of the governments in a welfare state you know the government offers many facilities to uh, their citizens. But we very well know that many of these benefits do not trickle down to the masses towards whom they are aimed at. And here e-governance can play a major role in the better delivery of the services offered by governments to citizens. And then it enables citizen empowerment, empowerment of the citizens through access to information or efficient management of the governmental machinery. And thirdly, it simplifies internal operations. Since transparency is there, you know, the simplified procedures will be there. And definitely that leads to increased performance, improved performance of the government departments. Then, it makes the services available at a lower cost. Say for example, if you want to say perhaps you might must be aware that the governments are making the subsidies available directly to the beneficiaries. Okay. Otherwise, you know, earlier it used to be uh, 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 done through the bureaucracy. There are uh, various levels of bureaucracy and the money has to reach the ultimate beneficiary through various levels. That inevitably leads to delay, that inevitably leads to corruption at uh, different stages when so many layers are there, so many tiers are there, you know, that also leads to corruption. But once it finds a way directly to the beneficiary, to the account of the beneficiary, you know, uh, definitely uh, it can be done at lower cost. Then, next is by employing online transactions, government processes become more or less streamlined. Because everything is decided in advance, the processes become streamlined and thereby it becomes um, efficient and there is less dependence on human intervention. Human intervention, the, uh, uh, the, the levels of people can be reduced to a very great extension and therefore delay can be uh, reduced and efficiency can be increased and then the cost of processing can be reduced uh, very much. If things are made available online, you know the cost can be reduced considerably resulting in great savings both on, both on the part of the government as well as on the part of the customer. Then electronic sharing of information between various departments that also is a boon. Say e-governance enables us to uh, intera enables interaction of the various departments. As I said earlier, the final stage is that the ultimate beneficiary will get the benefits even if more than one department or more than so many departments are involved because you can get it done uh, through ICT operations. So departments can share information and that leads to better governance. Then. Ultimately, this leads to an integrated e-governance portal, wherein the citizens, business, uh, uh, various governmental agencies, etc. are involved and the online transactions can be done, then people, all the stakeholders can access information and interaction with them is also facilitated. So that is the ultimate objective of um, e-governance, that is an integrated e-government um, uh, e portal. Then necessarily as far as the beneficiaries, beneficiaries are concerned that leads to, uh, that avoids long queues with which we are all accustomed to that can be avoided to a very great extent and wasting of um, office hours, you know, if you are employed, you know, you have to take leave and uh, uh, go to various offices to get your things done that can be avoided if you are able to do it online and a lot of paperwork can be reduced. and. Lot of paperwork can be reduced means uh, that also leads to energy conservation and uh, you know uh, the uh, I mean destruction of forest can be avoided and this also leads to a saving of time and ultimately to saving of money. And then in other words e-governance brings about any time anywhere access to the right person that is the motto of e-governance anytime anywhere access to the 
right person. Then, so in short, we can say that e-governance leads to reduced corruption, increased transparency, greater convenience, higher revenues, and lower costs. Okay, that means maximum output with minimum input. That is the catchword of uh, e-governance. Now, with Government of India has taken many initiatives uh, for e-governance at the national level. Various states have also taken their uh, uh, initiatives at the state level. Let us have a brief overview of uh, the uh, initiatives taken by the Government of India. And the first thing to be mentioned here, or the first thing worth mentioning here is the National E-Governance governance Plan. In short, it is known as NEGP, -E National E-Governance Plan, with uh, short E, N capital, uh, um, lowercase e, and then GP, capital letters. That takes care, a holistic view of the e-governance initiatives across the country. In fact, um, here as part of that massive infrastructure building activities are taking place. You know, the telecommunication infrastructure is uh, uh, taking a revolutionary change. Um, revolutionary strides are made in the uh, infrastructure, um, telecommunication infrastructure and the spreading of the internet, uh, internet facility, uh, otherwise known as internet penetration, then uh, including the remotest villages and a large scale digitization of their records. You know, huge files are being digitized. So these are the two prerequisites for that. One, increased infrastructure, optimum development of infrastructure and increased penetration of um, internet, coupled with the increased large scale digitization of the um, records at various levels. So the ultimate objective of this program, that is NEGP, is to bring public service closer home to citizens, as articulated in the vision statement of NEGP. There is a vision statement which states that the ultimate objective is to bring public services closer to the people, rather than the people going to the various government offices. And the major steps that have been taken place, that have taken place in this direction are, uh, a lot of, as I said earlier, a lot of infrastructural facilities have been established and the first one is uh, state data centers, that is the core infrastructural facilities at each and every state, otherwise known as SDCs, state uh, data centers. Then statewide service and uh, area networks, that is known as SWAN, statewide area networks that links up the uh, entire telecommunication infrastructure, internet infrastructure within the state, then common service centers, otherwise known as CSEs, then national e-governance service delivery gateway, NSDG, national e-governance service delivery gateway, then state e-governance service delivery gateway, then mobile e-governance service delivery gateway. Now, uh, we all know that uh, mobile phones are uh, spreading like anything. And that is uh, a technology which, has, uh, which was found to be very successful in spreading the messages. And that plays a major role in spreading the message of the e-governance. And as part of that, several, as I said, several additional facilities have to be made. Say, for example, uh, the guidelines on security measures, the human resources have to be developed, then citizen engagement policies, social media have to be effectively made use of, then the standards related to metadata. Metadata stands for data about data, which enables access points to, uh, ac uh, access points to the information contained in the web. If only metadata is very well developed, then only people can very well uh, easily uh, get the information required by them. Then there should be facilities for interoperability, enterprise architecture, information security, all these are accompaniments of the facilities which I have already mentioned. Then some of the new initiatives in this uh, venture are ePraman, GI Cloud to ensure the benefits of cloud computing, then e uh, and uh, for e-governance projects, etc. That cloud computing is uh, dependent on, on a long way as a, as a 
uh, in a big way, not as a long way, but in a big way uh, to apply countrywide e-governance network. Perhaps you may be aware of the fact that um, uh, the previous government has appointed a National Knowledge Commission, NKZ, under the chairmanship of Sam Pitroda. That is uh, just to uh, make recommendations on the steps that are to be taken in order to uh, equip our society, uh, the smooth transformation into a knowledge society. They have made several recommendations and as part of that they have also made strong recommendations uh, on e-governance. Some of the major recommendations are, one, learning from best practices and lessons from the past. Say we have to, all of a sudden we cannot implement them. So we have to learn from our previous mistakes. And that is what is meant by learning from best practices and lessons from the past. We can um, emulate the models if only they are found to be applicable to us. If only they are found to be uh, uh, applicable to us or successful to our environment. Then providing nationwide secure broadband infrastructure, which we already know that vital to the success of uh, e-governance. And it involves not only provision of hardware, but software and other hosting facilities. And the third one is web-based services, especially for providing localized data and services in Indian languages. You know, we have got thousands of languages in our country and uh, we have uh, 22 um, uh, languages which, is, which are nationally accepted. And if only information is made available in these regional languages also, then only it will reach the common man. So that is very much essential. If the information is available in English alone, it may not serve the purpose. If it is available in Hindi alone, it may not serve the purpose. If only all the major, uh, if only the information is available in all the, all the major inter languages, then only it will be uh, fruitful, it will be useful to the masses. Therefore, we have to provide the localized data and services in Indian languages. Then, as far as possible, we should depend upon open source software and open standards. That is very much essential. Anybody will agree with that. If only we adopt it, then only it will be, uh, it can be made available to uh, one and all, to all the stakeholders. If it is a proprietary software, I need not elaborate what are the limitations of proprietary software. And that is why they have vehemently gone for or argued for the adoption of open source software and open standards. Then appointment of specialized chief information technology officer. There should be a chief information technology officer at not only at the state level, but at the national level also, just to ensure uh, the smooth functioning of the e-governance operations. There should also be chief information technology officer in major central government departments. Then only really, uh, it can succeed. Then well-engineered e-governance implementation and web interface that ensured speed delivery, speedy delivery of information. Say it is not enough that information is available, but it should be, there should be mechanism for the speedy delivery of the information and which leads to uh, productivity and efficiency of the existing programs. Perhaps you might have heard about many of the uh, 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 programs national programs which are in existence like uh, Bharat Nirman program, then uh, rural employment guarantee schemes, then urban development initiatives, all these initiatives are there. If you want to speed up, if you want to propagate the message, definitely that has to uh, uh, reach the masses. So then, in other words, in a nutshell, we can say that creation and of an appropriate central organization with full autonomy and accountability to ensure the success of e-governance. That is one of the major recommendations or uh, one of the strong, uh, uh, strongest recommendation is this creation of an appropriate central organization with the rural, with full autonomy and accountability to ensure the success of e-governance. These are some of the major recommendations made by uh, the NKC, that is the Na National Knowledge Commission. We have just seen the crux of the elements of e-commerce and e-governance. That doesn't mean that uh, I have stated everything. I was just telling you about the basics. So, so far I have tried to focus upon the definition in a nutshell of what is meant by e-commerce and what is e-governance. 
I have also uh, tried to attempt a classification of the different types of um, e-commerce and I have also uh, uh, mentioned the uh, key factors in um, e-commerce and the roles, the role governments have to play uh, for the smooth adoption of the e-commerce. And then I have also dealt with the prerequisites for e-governance and the skills needed for the successful implementation, successful functioning of uh, e-governance. And we have also seen the benefits of um, e-governance and we have examined the major initiatives taken at the national level for the successful implementation of the e-governance and I have concluded with some of the recommendations made by the National Knowledge Commission uh, for the successful implementation of the e-governance at the national level. Now this is not enough, you have to go through some of the major references and you can uh, just go through the textual matter uh, which is uh, given along with that and there I have given uh, many references, uh, not only uh, books, I have given the websites also and they will prove to be of immense use to you. Uh, thank you very much.